are delighted to uh, be able to host Michael Dante from Boston University, the Department of Archaeology there. Uh, he has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania, and he remains a, a consulting scholar with the museum there. Uh, his undergraduate <coughs> work was at Purdue uh, in anthropology, actually, and history, minor history. He has worked as a curator and an archaeologist, as well as a, uh, as a teacher, university teacher. Uh, and uh, the occasion is a sad one. Um, we've all been increasingly um, distressed reading news stories of various sorts, but uh, as the Department of Art and Art History, um, we took particular notice on August 18th when Khaled al Assad was beheaded and his corpse strung up in the city of Palmyra, uh, and his crime was uh, trying to defend the antiquities of the city. Uh, he, uh, he observed the difference, I think, between respect and worship, which his killers um, were insensitive to. Uh, so partly in his honor and partly just to be aware of the wonderful ruins of Palmyra as we uh, read about them in the news, we invited um, Dr. Dante to speak to us. His title is The Ancient City of Palmyra and the Destruction of Syria's Cultural Heritage, and he will take questions afterwards. Please welcome him. Thank you very much. Hopefully the slides will advance here. I'm going to have to try to get, uh, there's not enough room to copy the presentation on the computer. So. Excuse me. Uh, my hearing isn't the greatest, and uh, yeah, quite well, you know. So this was uh, the program that I'm the academic director of began in 2014. It is essentially a uh, program between the State Department and the American Schools of Oriental Research. In 2014, the State Department put out a request for proposals to found a program to work on the cultural heritage crises in Syria. As soon as that program was awarded to the American Schools of Oriental Research, we had to add northern Iraq to the program because ISIL had expanded into Mosul, or the Islamic State ISIS. We have been working on that program. I've been the academic director of that program since August 3rd of last year, and we just received a one-year renewal, unfortunately, to continue our work for another year because the cultural heritage crisis is so severe. As you'll see, so in effect, this program is a, a, a ASOR Cultural Heritage Initiatives. It's formed out of these groups that you see on this slide, and it is essentially a quasi-non-government organization working through ASOR, and we have a large group of international partners. The, uh, the program essentially has three major objectives, documenting damage. That's how I spend most of my time on a weekly basis, writing reports to the State Department on cultural heritage damage. Uh, we also submit quarterly reports. We do a lot of presentation promoting global awareness of the cultural heritage crisis in the conflict zone. And we produce uh, disaster planning and disaster relief planning and emergency response plans. For the current time, during the conflict, and for the post-conflict period, uh, my main task, besides being the academic director of the program, is to work on ground-based observations. So I have built a in-country networks in Syria and Iraq to gather information on heritage damage essentially on a daily basis, and then we supplement those ground-based observations with satellite imagery to monitor the situation in Syria and northern Iraq. Uh, since the start of the project, this is what I have spent most of my time on, which is the Islamic State, or ISIS, or ISIL as the State Department prefers it to call. As this group has expanded out across northern Iraq and Syria, it has brought cultural cleansing to a large area. The Islamic State essentially has an overt policy, very systematic policy, of cultural cleansing in the region. And they have destroyed, deliberately destroyed, hundreds of cultural sites in northern Syria and northern Iraq, as well as they have also looted large numbers of archaeological sites for funding. So in short, as you'll see, Islamic State sells portable material culture to fund its operations, and they destroy buildings and monuments to promote their ideology, which is a radical jihadi Salafi ideology that believes in a 
literal interpretation of Islam, essentially emulating the seventh century caliphate, eighth century. We are now at the end of our first year, very quickly just to show you the results, the very depressing results of one year of the ASOR Cultural Heritage Initiatives. We have put in reports on 711 heritage incidents in Syria, most of them highly destructive heritage incidents, and around 80 incidents in Iraq. These numbers are actually much higher, but we're still working on the reporting from our first year. So we've monitored massive destruction across Syria and Iraq. Today's topic is Syria, so I focus on the geographic distribution of that damage. And as you can see on the far left, the government or uh, area of Aleppo has suffered greatly, in, as well as Hasaka and Dara. These are areas of northern and southern Syria that have seen a lot of combat, combat kinetics. But they're also heavily looted, and in some cases they are, as in Aleppo and Dara, we're seeing a lot of deliberate destruction of heritage places by extremists. And then you can see a drop as we move to the right into areas that are Syrian regime controlled. Reef Damash, Damascus, Latakia, Soweda, and Kunetra. In the middle of this chart, you see Raqqa. This is an area where I worked for 20 years in northern Syria, where you see the lake on the Euphrates there. That area is drastically underreported in terms of its heritage damage because it is firmly within the grasp of the Islamic State. And it is difficult for us to get information on looting and heritage damage in those areas. This chart shows the types of destruction that we're seeing in the first year. And I would say that it's fairly accurate overall in terms of the, the forces that we see destroying the heritage of Syria. Uh, you see on the far left, the most frequently reported damage incident is looting. But I would emphasize that this is not necessarily the highest order magnitude in terms of destruction. It has less impact. In some cases, this looting is just a few holes dug by villagers in an archaeological mound. In other cases, however, it is the complete destruction of archaeological sites by groups like the Islamic State, where we see industrial scale looting. And I'll show you some of that in this presentation. Then we see combat damage, both deliberate and in collateral damage, digging for other reasons, not necessarily antiquities, but digging on archaeological sites that result in the, uh, the destruction of archaeological contexts and the discovery of antiquities for the illicit market. But that digging is done for military reasons or un uncontrolled development, agricultural and building development. Illegal construction is a major problem in standing remains, particularly for the Byzantine period remains of Western Syria. There's a high degree of vandalism associated with the refugee crisis. And, it, and so on. As we get into the, the, the right hand side of this chart where we see tunnel bombs and thefts and facility thefts, these are fairly infrequent types of heritage damage, but they are extremely high impact. For example, under facilities theft, we have a number of robberies of excavation storehouses or museum collections in the north and east of Syria, where thousands and thousands of antiquities have been taken and sold onto the illicit market. Tunnel bombing, which is a fairly rare incident, uh, tunnel bombs in the city of Aleppo, for example, when a tunnel bomb goes off, it takes out part of the city block and usually a large chunk of the UNESCO World Heritage Site ancient city of Aleppo. So again, an infrequent episode in our chart, but high impact. Looting is rampant. It has been since the start of the Syrian conflict in 2011, but the short the short answer to who's doing looting and where is it occurring, it's happening everywhere. And we usually, as we usually describe it, who's doing it? Everyone with a shovel is looting archaeological sites in Syria right now, some more systematically than others. This chart shows in red areas under Syrian regime control, and it's not up to date. It's already out of date. Green is opposition controlled, yellow, Kurdish controlled, and blue, ISIL or Islamic State controlled. The size of the circles on this chart show the intensity of looting at a sample of sites visible in satellite imagery. And you can see the percentages of looting in each of these zones of control. And it's fairly consistent from zone to zone, where, for example, we see in Kurdish occupied areas, 23.5% of archaeological sites in this sample, looked at by Jesse Kasana on our project, had shown some signs of conflict-related looting. They do disambiguate this and take out pre-conflict looting. So we do look at imagery from the pre-conflict period. There was looting before the conflict in Syria, but it was fairly rare. What we've seen since the start of the Syrian conflict is an intensification in looting, 
on sites that were previously looted, but the expansion of looting into new areas. And in areas under Islamic State control, we see industrial scale looting where entire sites are being removed from the face of the earth using heavy machinery and metal detectors. This looting is also uh, targeting specific time periods of sites, and there is definitely a preference in ISIL or ISIS-controlled territories to loot sites of the Seleucid, Roman, and Byzantine eras, when we believe that's because those are, uh, the antiquities from those sites are readily marketable, and they're easy to launder. When they're brought onto the market, it is easy to argue that these coins, mosaics, and sculptures are coming from somewhere in the eastern Mediterranean region and not necessarily in the area of Syria or Iraq. And so there is market-driven looting going on. I can't go into it in too much detail. Palmyra, specifically, has been our major case on the Azor Cultural Heritage Initiatives for about the last couple of months. Well, really since May, losing track of time a bit. As soon as Islam, we knew that Islamic State would probably move on Palmyra, given that it is a very important hub in the Syrian transportation network of the Syrian desert. It is an important town for oil and, and natural gas, and it, it, it was a, it, it, a kind of a obvious target for Islamic State once they had captured the town of Raqqa to the north. Uh, Palmyra itself is a, is a well-known archaeological site, settled from the early Bronze Age, 3rd millennium BC, it becomes more important in the early Iron Age, and it really sort of becomes a major urban center in the Syrian desert in the Seleucid area after the conquests of Alexander the Great. We read of it in the campaigns of Antony, who failed to take the town in 41 BC. But it's in the first century BC that Palmyra really becomes a major, major uh, hub in the transportation networks of this region, linking China to the Mediterranean region. It's part of the Silk Road, it's a part of the spice trade, and this is because of shifts in, in trade routes in Turkey that favor then Palmyra to the south. Palmyra is located out in the Syrian desert. You can see those routes coming across from the Euphrates River, linking in to that hub at Tadmor, that's its modern name and ancient name, or Palmyra, and then you can see those routes going on to Amiza or Homs, up towards Aleppo or down towards the area of Damascus. As if we look up at the north of this towards Anatolia or Turkey, the area of Osir Hoani, in the first century BC, those areas had become fairly unstable in the Seleucid period, and so Palmyra became that favored location. It, it holds this role of, of famous desert oasis because of the EFQA, EFQA, EFQA oasis. As we move into the Roman era, very quickly, I'll move through this time chart, what we see is that with the, the Roman conquest of the region, Palmyra, Tadmor is a, a neutral city. It's part of the Roman Empire, essentially, although it's arguable, but it's essentially neutral territory between the Parthians in Persia, great enemies of the Romans, and the Romans in western Syria. And over time, as you can see in, in bullet point number one, we see steadily uh, closer contacts in integration within the Roman Empire. Although our details on this are fairly sketchy for a period of time, then as we move into the second century, Palmyra really sort of comes into its own and becomes a fabulously wealthy center. It is probably the most important trading city in the Eastern Empire in the second century. In its residents, many of them, its, its families or tribal groups become fabulously wealthy, being able to negotiate between the Parthians and the Romans and local tribal groups of Arabs who control this desert route. <clears throat> Unfortunately, towards the end of the second century, Parth uh, Palmyra begins to shift from a major trading center to more of a military site where the Romans try to secure their eastern frontier against the Parthians with the Parthian Wars. It becomes a colonia under Caracalla in 212, and then with the rise of the very aggressive Sasanian Empire in Persia, in the early third century, Palmyra begins to really become a major military center. And this marks a very important shift in, in Palmyra's history, which we'll return to in a moment. We know a great deal about Palmyra because of its, its Palmyrene and Greek inscriptions. Just very quickly, it does have its own writing system, a consonatory alphabet that was used to write Aramaean, a local dialect of Aramaean. We see here the most famous inscription from Palmyra, the city tariff inscription of 137 AD, written in Palmyrene and Greek, which specifies the tariffs on imports and exports from the city. 
and the price of bringing camels into the city, the price of water for herd animals, what have you. Again, emphasizing its importance as an entrepot. The Palmyrene script is in the center column there. And we do have a great deal of Palmyrene written from it that it's found in the tombs of the sites and in other locations there. But much of what we know about Palmyra comes from its amazing architecture. This is a, a fairly recent satellite image that shows the area irrigated by the Efka Oasis. The modern city is up to your right there. And you can see the various parts of the site that I'll be discussing. Much of this architecture dates to the early first and second, or the, the first and second century AD. So here's the, the major temple of the site, the Temple of Bel. This massive temple, Sella is located here, sits in a large square Temenos area. We'll be talking about it specifically. The Temple Bel was the head of the Semitic pantheon for Syria and Iraq in this time period. The Temple of Nabu, a god of wisdom who goes all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and the Bronze Age. The Roman theater, its marketplace, uh, the Agora. And then you see this important axis here, this colonnaded street that makes a, a distinct angle. This is the central artery of ancient Palmyra. The site takes in 19 kilometers squared of, of remains. The Seleucid town is to the south in this direction. So most, most of what we're seeing here is from the Roman era. The tetrapylon marks a, a, an angle in the colonnaded street, and that moves out towards Kalat Shirku. Now, below Kalat Shirku, which is a high point, you have Diocletian's camp and the Diocletian wall. And the last point of interest here, besides the Baal Shaman Temple, the Lord of Heaven Temple, is the, the modern Tadmor or Palmyra Archaeological Museum. And these are the sites that we'll be discussing. Um, other points of interest, for most people that travel to the site, they spend a day or two looking at the Roman remains, but the really fascinating parts of the site are its southwest necropolis and the Valley of the Tombs, which we'll also, unfortunately, be discussing today. So first of all, the Temple of Bel, very quickly, a very large temple that essentially, in terms of its plan, goes back to the Bronze Age temples of, of, of Semitic Syria and northern Iraq. It is very much a, a Semitic, Semitic temple with Roman stylistic elements. Here you see its cella, and on the outside, the remaining columns of its peristyle hall. Uh, it's a very large temple and very well preserved because in the Byzantine era, it served as a church. And in the Arab period, or the, the Muslim period following the Muslim conquest, it, was, it contained an important mosque and served as a fortress. Extremely well preserved until recently, dating to about the 17, about to 17 to 19 BC, dedicated according to Roman history in around 32, and then added on to over time. Some of my photographs of the inside of it, it has two cult targets, one on the south and one on the north. This one was uh, probably for the statue of the god Bel, and this triple group of gods, Yarhibol, a solar god, and Oglibol. And like other Semitic temples, it has another Aditon that was probably for a processional statue of the god for important events. Can't spend too much time on the Temple of Bel, unfortunately, but we'll return to it shortly. Then the central axis of Palmyra, Really, one of my favorite parts of the site. An extremely well preserved colonnaded street spanning 1.2 kilometers. In the background, there you see the Arab fortress from the 13th century called Kalat Shirku, which is a great place to take pictures of the site uh, before Islamic State showed up. Some of my photographs from 2010, the last time I was able to visit the site. We always like to take the camel rides down the colonnaded street. This is the famous monumental arch, which marks one of the, the slight angles in the, the main thoroughfare. Palmyra really never achieved a, a Roman grid plan. The, the site grew up over time through accretion, adding monumental buildings to make it slightly more important and prestigious. Uh, but it was clear that there was no single unifying plan for its major layout. This is the famous tetrapylon, which is on the poster for this talk which is largely restored, it was restored in 1963, so much of what you see is concrete in the columns. One column did stand in the early 20th century, or the mid 20th century when this was reconstructed, and it was made of red Osman granite from Egypt. Gives you some idea of the wealth of Palmyra in antiquity. 
As we move down that colonnaded street, you pass the theater on your left. This is, uh, was heavily reconstructed by the Syrian government up to about its ninth tier of seating. And we used to love to visit this part. This is where I would give lectures. Uh, we, I, I used to run a field school in Syria. So you can see that the main part of the stage there and what has been reconstructed of that seating dates to the second century. Off to one side of the main thoroughfare, you have the Baal Shaman Temple, also dated to about 17 AD, which has both Roman and Egyptianizing elements, and to my mind, really captures the Palmyrene style. So you have Semitic influences, you have Persian influences, Greco-Roman influences, all coming together in this architecture. Palmyrene antiquity was a, was, a, a, was a melting pot with a polyglot of languages that were spoken here, a number of different cults, and the Baal Shaman Temple really, really captures all of that. This is the front view of the Baal Shaman Temple and what was left of it the last time I saw it. With an altar out in front. Back to the main thoroughfare, we have the Agara. Not especially well preserved, but to give you some idea of just typical preservation at Palmyra. And moving on, just out to the side of the Roman town, we have the Valley of the Tombs, my favorite part of the site. As you look out, this is looking out from Kalat Shirkub, that 13th century Arab fortress. And what you're seeing here is sort of the, uh, the morning light was always the best time to photograph Palmyra. Everything was always bleached out otherwise, or right after a rain. And I would usually go about every year to this site, and this is probably the best photograph I was able to get of the, the Valley of the Tombs. What you see here are tower tombs. This is an influence from Persia, a Zoroastrian influence. These were owned by some of the wealthier families at Palmyra and had incredible preservation when they were first explored by Europeans in the 18th, 19th century, in some cases still containing mummified remains, large numbers of textiles, uh, Chinese silk, for example. Also in these areas, this is one popular way for burial in the Greco-Roman period. Wealthy Palmyrenes were, were frequently buried in these large tower tombs. There you see a hotel over to the left, encroaching on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Plans of these tower tombs. One of the better preserved when the tower tomb of Yom Bleed. And what they looked like in 2010. Large numbers of them. Other Greco-Roman residents of Palmyra were buried in large uh, subterranean hypogea. There are a number of these at the site that contain numerous loculi with uh, stone doors that show, that, uh, that show the deceased individual, also elaborately carved sarcophagi in niches. This particular tomb, the Hypogeum of Yarhai, was disassembled and reconstructed in the Damascus Museum. So, returning to Palmyra's timeline, probably the height of Palmyra when it, was when it becomes an independent kingdom in the third century. And this is largely due to uh, a, a crisis that develops in the Eastern Empire with the rise of the Sasanians who take the Romans somewhat by surprise. And because of this crisis, a, a single dynasty at Palmyra, the Julii Aurelii Septimii, rise up and its leader, its tribal leader, Odenophis Septimi, in 252 to 267, is able to become the ruler of Palmyra. He is very successful in meeting the Sasanian threat in the Eastern Empire, which the Romans are very thankful for, but then he probably became something of a nuisance. The, the Romans had lost the Euphrates city of Dura Europis, which I will show you in a bit. Uh, Odenophis is able to fight back the Sasanians, but then he probably is something of a threat, and he is murdered in 267, 268 with one of his, I believe, his oldest son. After his murder, his wife, Zenobia, one of his wives, uh, essentially acts as regent for her young son, Wabaloth, or Wabalathus. And this is the, the founding of the Palmyrene Empire. Zenobia very quickly conquers western Syria after move, uh, attacking Palmyra's Roman garrison. She conquers large parts of Anatolia, including the important town of Antioch, actually goes all the way into Egypt, 
And we see this very short-lived empire. At one point, Zenobia thought she, her aspirations were so high that she would be ruling an eastern empire and the Romans the western part of the empire as a dual unit. Zenobia is uh, essentially, th this rebellion is put down by Aurelian in 272. Aurelian very quickly captures Anatolia, defeats a Palmyrene force at Amisa, or modern Homs, then moves on Palmyra. And without too much effort, captures Palmyra. Zenobia tries to flee on a camel to Persia, but she's captured trying to cross the Euphrates River, and is taken back to Rome, according to one history, where she is paraded in a triumphal a triumph of Aurelian, which got his, uh, earned his Aurelian censor in the Senate for parading a woman in a triumph, and she lives out her days in a villa near Tivoli, not far from Aurelian. Uh, Palmyra rises up again in 273, and it, this time the Romans are merciless. They sack the city, they slaughter large numbers of the city's occupants, and they plunder the treasury of the Temple of Baal and destroy the temple or parts of it. So from this time period, we have the camp of Diocletian and the Roman rampart. The city at this point, after the Roman sack, becomes a, a, a Roman fortress. And you can see that Roman wall enclosing the, the main part of the site. This is the earlier wall, probably going back to the Seleucid era. And right at the base of Kala Chirku there, on the left red arrow, you have the camp of Diocletian, fairly well preserved until recent call it your coup in the background. Now, Palmyra has been obviously central in, in Syrian archaeology. It was a large part of Syrian tourism for decades and had one of the more modern museums in Syria. Uh, it's been excavated by large numbers of expeditions over the last hundred years or so. What I'd like to show now is the Tadmor Museum, rather than relying on, let's say, the, the Damascus Museum and its collections. This, these are my photographs of what the Damascus Museum looked like in 2010. You see that at a, like most museums in Syria, had a sculpture park. Out in the front were large sarcophagi, boss reliefs, and, and sculptures sometimes in the round. This is the Al Lot lion, <coughs> were kept too large for the inside of the museum. This is the opposite view with Palmyrene sculpture, sarcophagi. And inside, typical of the Tadmor Museum, you see sculpture from the Hypogea tombs, architectural ornaments, mosaics. They had a display of mummies, which I'm not going to show. But an incredible range of sculpture in the Palmyrene style at the Tadmor Museum. It also had a diorama showing Neolithic life in the Tadmor region. It was it had uh, audio guides in English, probably one of the more modern museums in the country in 2010. Again, it was the jewel in the, of the crown of Syrian tourism. And then, as we thought would happen, in May, the Islamic State captured Palmyra after a very short fight. It didn't take them very long. This is uh, my photograph of the site from Khalid Shirku. Not too long before that happened destroy things, but they didn't target the Greco-Roman remains. When Islamic State captures new territory, they first target Islamic heritage and Christian heritage as a way to try to purify the region for the Caliphate. So one of the first things they did is they destroyed a nearby shrine on a hill not far from modern Tadmor, the shrine of Sheikh Muhammad ben Ali, and destroyed that and then posted the destruction online. It's a Shia site, and the Shia are the primary target, the main target, of the Islamic State. They're trying to increase tensions. The Islamic State would like to spark a Shia-Sunni regional conflict, a larger one. They then began to target Sufi heritage in Tadmor. Sufism is a sect, not really, but it's a sect of, of Sunni Islam, a mystical sect, that the Islamic State views as being heretical. And so they blew up a local Sunni shrine near the Efka oasis and posted it on social media. Again, Greco-Roman remains were still intact. They began to destroy the modern cemeteries of Palmyra. They sent the residents of the city out to smash up the, the modern graves, which they deem inappropriate to Islam because they're above ground level, and posted that on social media. 
and then we began to see some destruction of Greco-Roman remains. So that in the first phases, really, Islamic State was consolidating its grip on the on Palmyra or Tadmor. One of the other things they did when they first moved in was they destroyed the infamous Tadmor prison, a regime political prison that had operated most of the time that I'd worked in Syria since 1991, um, and had become pretty full during the, the, Syrian, the Syrian Civil War. ISIL released the prisoners and blew that prison up. Tadmor also had an important air base. Then we saw some destructions going on. Now, before ISIL came to Palmyra, the site had suffered quite a bit of the damage. Um, the Syrian military, starting in 2011-2012, fortified parts of the site, the UNESCO World Heritage Site. They, they used bulldozers to build earthen fortifications. There were Syrian troops using Kalat Shirku as an observation post. There were foxholes dug all over the site. And we can see this in satellite imagery. And while the Assad regime's troops were at the site, there was looting of the hypogea. Looters dug down into the hypogea and were stealing sculptures from the loculi and chiseling away parts of sarcophagi. And I'll show you how we know that in a second. But there were reports being released 2012, 13, 2014. And the site was suffering. But with the arrival of Islamic State, things got far worse. One of the first things that we saw in terms of Islamic State destruction of Greco-Roman remains didn't occur in Palmyra. It occurred in the northern town of Benbij. The Islamic State smashed up Palmyrene funerary sculptures that were being smuggled through this northern town towards Lebanon. Now, why would Islamic State smash up these sculptures? Why wouldn't they sell them? Because the smuggler that they caught with these sculptures was not licensed by the Islamic State to traffic them. And so he was lashed publicly, and his sculptures were smashed. That's the only reason they destroyed these sculptures. Generally, these would be sold by the Islamic State. What they generally do is they license people to loot, license people to traffic antiquities, and then they take a cut of the antiquities sales. Then things got extremely disturbing. There were initial reports of looting at the site when Islamic State moved in, and the looting of the museum. But as Syrian forces retreated from Palmyra, they made a very valiant effort. The Directorate General of Antiquities and Museums in Damascus made a valiant and dangerous effort to evacuate large amounts of material. And they estimate three truckloads of material made it back to Damascus from the museum. But we know that a large amount of material had to be left behind. If you look at that sculpture garden and the size of the sculptures in that sculpture garden, you can think how difficult it would be to move some of those pieces. If you think about what we saw inside the museum, many of the sculptures from Palmyra were, held, were attached to the walls of the gallery with steel mounts that would have had to have been cut away. And we know that a large number of those pieces had to be probably left behind as well. So there was some looting. We heard reports of destruction. But probably the, the first horrific incident was, occurred in the, the Roman theater. And this is not the destruction of the actual Roman theater. What we, we saw, there was a video released in July, on July the 4th, the timing is always important with Islamic State, of Islamic State boy soldiers marching Syrian men in Syrian uniform into the theater. And then there was a mass execution on camera of those, those men by these boy soldiers in front of a large number of Tadmor residents who were in the, the actual theater seats. And when you look at the social media of this, these, these people are crying watching this mass execution. And this was something slightly different from Islamic State in terms of the use of a heritage site for a mass execution. And it has, obviously, important implications for the intangible elements of this heritage. I used to lecture here. My students like to pose on the stage. I used to have happy thoughts about this, I think, as most people did. I look at this now, and what's burned into my memory, and I think most people's memories, is the, the war crimes that were committed in this area on May the 27th, 2015. Islamic State then began to focus on local Christian heritage, such as the Mar Elian Monastery, or the St. Julian Monastery, famed for its wall paintings. They also they destroyed this site in August, on August 21st, using bulldozers, and then kidnapped uh, between two and 300 of the, the area's Christian residents and sent them off to we don't know where. They destroyed the Allah Lion outside the uh, Palmyra Museum at about the same time. 
looks like something designed by Freud. They destroyed the Neolithic diorama in the museum. They found that offensive. <clears throat> and then they executed an important Syrian archaeologist who had been working in Palmyra, who had helped in the evacuation of the antiquities, 82-year-old Khalid al-Assad, retired, but former director of Palmyra Antiquities, a long time, a long time uh, advocate of, of Syrian tourism and antiquities, and worked for the director general, obviously, of antiquities and museums. He'd been captured once and released. They captured Khalid a second time and executed him publicly in Tadmor on the street. Then, at about the same time, they began to turn towards the Greco-Roman remains. We knew that they had planted explosives all over the site. Our, our, uh, our contacts in Tadmor were giving us some idea of where these explosives had been planted, and the first structure to be destroyed was the Baal Shaman Temple. Sorry to show you these things, but it, it first appeared on uh, ISIL show, social media, completely destroyed. Massive explosion. We knew this was the beginning of the end for many of its, the site's monuments, particularly monuments with religious associations. We had a pretty good idea that next would be the Bell Temple, and unfortunately we were correct. We heard reports, and it was later verified, that about 30 tons of explosives were put in the cella of this temple. Here is a satellite image before. To my knowledge, they haven't released the photographs of the destruction yet on social media. Maybe they have, but I haven't found it yet. And this is a satellite image after. So before, after, right? Uh, almost complete destruction. What you see still standing there, that shadow in the area of the cell is the main entrance. There's just a small part of it still standing. The Temenos itself, the outer colonnade is still intact, as well as the retaining wall. But the Temple of Bell is gone. And then most recently, they turn on the tower tombs in the Valley of the Tombs. Our project was the first to release this information. And they have destroyed six of these tower tombs. And what's insidious about what they're doing is they are destroying the most significant of the tower tombs. They have a lot of targets. They also have all these hypogea. And so we've been, we were monitoring these in the satellite imagery. This is the tower tomb of Kithoth, dated to 40 AD. No visible damage on June the 26th. And it's gone. They packed them with explosives, and they've destroyed six of the tombs and severely damaged a seventh tower tomb. So. We've seen widespread destruction so far at Palmyra. We have reports from the site that they are planning more of these destructions, so brace yourselves. What our project is trying to do is to release the information on these destructions before Islamic State does, so that they cannot use the timing for propagandistic purposes. Frequently, they film these destructions, they add music, they edit these videos, and then they release some on specific dates that are either important to them or they think they're dates that are important to us. So we try to take that initiative away from them. We also try to post this information accurately online so that there is an accurate place to go for the media or for other people to access this, to try to counter that ISIL, ISIS propaganda. Um, it's difficult because we also have to make decisions to show photographs of these destructions, and it does gain media attention for ISIL inevitably. Why is ISIL doing this in Palmyra? According to local Tadmor sources, when they talk to ISIL, ISIL fighters talk to their commanders. Their commanders say, this is an easy way for us to get media attention, especially in the West. Whenever we carry out one of these destructions, we're all over the news. And in the Tadmor area, they seem to be particularly interested in being in the news. We've seen similar destructions at sites like Hatra in northern Iraq, or ISIL has come in about the same time period, again, as Palmyra, a tight, important Arab kingdom, Seleucid Roman period, and where they've destroyed large parts of this site with sledgehammers, with AK-47s. They're looting sites from the same time period like Apamea in western Syria, before and after. This was done by the Syrian regime, actually, sorry. And so on. We see looting all over in this region by ISIL and other groups. So the Seleucid, Roman, Parthian, Byzantine periods, Sassanian periods, are being heavily looted. When we look at the antiquities markets, there have been a lot of seizures of antiquities in Lebanon, Turkey, and Syria of Palmyrene material, massive amounts of it, before ISIL came in and after. Huge numbers of Palmyrene funerary sculptures, sarcophagi. 
When we look at Palmyra, we have photographs of the looting. Before ISIL, ISIL intends to loot the site for money as well, according to our, our, our sources. And lots and lots of other antiquities from this time period and other time periods. We've documented about a thousand antiquities last year on the market in the region. Much of it, again, from the classical period. And a lot of it on its way to Europe and from Palmyra. These sculptures were in Western Turkey being shipped to somewhere in Europe when we documented them last year. So, that's where I probably should stop. I could go on about this, but it's a, it's a very, very, it's a dire situation in Palmyra. Um, obviously, Islamic State's going to continue these destructions at the site. And as they come into new territory, uh, as their footprint expands in Syria, which it may, uh, right now, they are probably set to expand their territory. We can expect far more of these destructions. But again, you see how they work. They destroy Muslim and Christian heritage, Yazidi heritage, the heritage of ethnic and religious minorities first, or their big opponents, the Shia. They then will slowly loot for money, and then they focus on pre-Islamic antiquities, especially uh, large monuments, in this insidious way, based on their significance or perceived significance, to gain media attention. They justify this saying that these sites are idolatrous or heretical, polytheistic, but in reality I think that it's really simply part of their propaganda campaign. So there are there is some good news from, from Syria, if you're if you're wondering. In areas that are regime and opposition controlled, there are concerted efforts to preserve cultural heritage. It's where we see radical extremists like Jabhat al-Nusra in Islamic State, where we see wanton destruction and really in these areas, the international community can't go in and work with local groups to try to preserve cultural assets. Thank you very much. Um, who is creating the demand for these looted antiquities? Uh, there is a new market out there that is being reached using digital photographs and the internet. So the turkeys are moved, the, the, the antiquities rather, are moved to Turkey, Lebanon, or they've been kept in Syria, and then photographs are used to find potential buyers. And those buyers are not the people that would buy from galleries or auction houses. It, we're not seeing a lot of antiquities reaching those sort of conventional markets. It's mostly fairly direct, and sometimes it's direct from groups like ISIL to potential buyers. And so we've had buyers, people posing as buyers or you know that or people that have been offered antiquities come to our project from Sweden, Norway, Britain, France, Holland, the United States saying these antiquities are being offered to me by someone. They found me on the internet. I collect this or I collect that, but I think this stuff is from the conflict. And then they're getting large numbers of these photographs that the dealers are using to suss out the size of their pocketbook and then their tastes. Do these people want to buy coins? Are they interested in architectural spolia? Do they want to buy mosaics for their house? I mean, they're stealing whole mosaics and rolling them up inside of carpets to, to traffic out of that conflict sound. So it's pretty much everything. Uh, a lot of the larger pieces go to the Gulf. Some of the material goes to Turkey and Lebanon. And then the major transshipment points are Cyprus, Greece, Bulgaria. So if you follow the refugee crisis, you're following the way antiquities get to Europe and the United States. There is some talk about China, and in East Asia being major buyers, but I have not seen that. I've see, I, there, there's a lot of talk about the material going to the Gulf, both for purchase and as a transshipment point, makes perfect sense, but I've not seen much of that going through Jordan. We, we've documented some. So, so far, most of what we've seen is going to Turkey and Lebanon, and then it goes towards southeastern Europe. Usually it's being smuggled with a lot of other contraband, and the objective is to get it inside of free trade zones, like Schengen so that it can be moved around. And then once the material gets into Europe, it goes from dealer to dealer for a period of time, which is fairly typical of the market, until it eventually reaches a buyer. But these buyers are, the antiquities that we're seeing are the low and middle end of the market. So up into the tens of thousands of dollars, maybe 100,000, 200,000. We know that really high end pieces are being stolen from museums uh, and, and, and from archeological sites. But those antiquities disappear. We don't have that digital trail of photographs where we can follow them out of the conflict zone. So we know they're stealing them, and they're either caching that, those antiquities, for a later time, or they're being dealt fairly directly to very wealthy buyers. 
where it's it's loot, uh, loot for hire, theft for hire sorts of a crime. But we're not sure yet. It's speculative. We would be speculating on that. Other questions for you? Yes. If ISIL is doing this for, um, if they're stealing these antiquities for um, media attention, mm -hmm. then is there any way for the international community to look at online sites like like YouTube or, or wherever they might be uploading their videos to crack down on that? And if you can upload right. the video, then you get rid of all of the media. Yeah, so on the one hand, so open source information. Part of our project, I do, the, I do both the ground-based information and then we have open source information. So we have a network of volunteers, heritage experts, uh, interns that work with us to look at Twitter, any paste it, just paste it, all these sites that ISIL fighters use where they're being used to deal the antiquities. We're also looking at the sites that they use to promote the destructions of monuments and houses of worship. It's a huge effort to try to, to scour all of this on a daily basis, but then we use that to follow the market and to counter their financing. And we use it as a way to get some idea of what they're destroying or what other, other belligerents are destroying in the conflict zone on a daily basis. What we find, and it's kind of sad, but ISIL is very accurate in posting information on what they destroy. They, they seldom lie, and they're usually, they post information fairly rapidly. Their fighters love to tweet. ISIL has tried to crack down on their fighters to get them to stop doing that because they're tweeting during combat and they're providing US coalition forces and other groups targeting information. So there was a, an effort to blank all of that out, but a lot of ISIL's fighters are late teens, early 20s, and they're addicted to the internet. So they're always chattering about what's going on. And, and that includes the destruction of monuments, and then again, they're using this technology to market antiquities and, and essentially run their operation logistically. And so that's something new in the market, and that's what creates that digital trail, and then we my idea is, again, to gather all that information on the antiquities market and turn it back against them. They're using this as a way to get past law enforcement and to mass market antiquities, especially to unsuspecting buyers or people that think, I'll buy these antiquities to save them. No. If you're buying them, the damage is already done, right? The archaeological sites are destroyed, cultural cleansings already happened, and ISIL's already got their it, its money, or the other groups, they've got their money before the antiquities leave the country. So what buyers are doing is maintaining the market space for this material. So the groups are using the internet to mass market this stuff to a new group of people. What we want to do now, I think in our year two, is to make a, this information publicly available to everyone, law enforcement, the media, and everyone else out there so that they can see the antiquities that we're all seeing coming off, off this market. To that, and we believe that that would probably increase due diligence by let's we'll say the bulk buyers of antiquities or cultural institutions that might be buying cultural property. The legal market, right, that needs to exercise due diligence. Well, let's show them the stuff that's coming from the conflict zone. The massive numbers of coins, mosaics, sculptures, bronzes, so that everyone can get some idea. It would also really help with public awareness. To, and we, we've got about a thousand photographs or so of those antiquities that we could provide, but we need to, to come up with an online database and, and a secure site for posting that information, but that's where I think we're going to go in year two on that to try to counter this mass marketing of antiquities by terrorist organizations. Other questions? Okay. When you visited in 2010 and earlier, how did the people of Palmyra feel about those antiquities? Did they were they proud of them, or did they think of it as something that brought tourists and money in? Did they identify with that heritage? Do you have some sense of, and did that change over the time that you were visiting? Yeah, and then yeah. sort of addendum to that question, how does ISIL, do they use a term like cultural cleansing, or do they have some other terminology like they're doing? Yeah, so starting with the last part, ISIL calls it a process of tasfiyah in Arabic, which means purification, where they stamp out things that are shirk and bayah, uh, anything that's innovative or polytheistic, uh, so that they're looking for anything that's called shirk. And that's one of the words you're hearing their videos of off and on all the time, is their fighters go on and they, they give speeches as to why they're destroying cultural assets. And so they tell us why they're doing it. And one of their videos, when they destroyed the Northwest Palace, uh, when they destroyed sites, and let's, let's keep it generic, in northern Iraq, their fighters come on and say, you the Iraqi people, 
have been told that this is part of your cultural identity. This pre-Islamic polytheistic material is part of your identity. And they say it is not part of your identity as Muslims. And we are here to tell you that. And as good Muslims, this is not part of your identity and you must reject it. And America has told you this is part of your identity. They address it as, you know, you've been told this is your cultural identity. We're here to purify that and to counter that colonial message that essentially was put in place to divide and conquer all of us. We need to unify Islam through a process of tawhid, unification, and that's what Salafists are trying to do, or well, these radical Salafists in Syria and Iraq are trying to do, is unify Islam under this 7th century interpretation. Um, the people of Palmyra, a love-hate relationship with the regime and with the heritage. If you were to go to Tadmor, there was a massive regime prison in the middle of the town and a very strong secret police presence and an air base and soldiers, and many of them were not welcome. So Tadmor was a tribal Sunni Arab population that was not especially fond of the Assyrian or the, the, of the Syrian regime, the Assad regime. At the same time, they're no great supporters of Islamic State. They're trapped between the two. During the conflict, when I would go there, there was one cross section of Tadmor society that made a lot of money off the tourist industry. But they always lamented that large amounts of the money and a lot of the antiquities went to Damascus, to the National Museum, although they would considered themselves fortunate because in other areas of Syria, there weren't local site museums, there wasn't local development, there wasn't a lot done for local stakeholders to, for buy-in, to preserve heritage, to provide them with an economic incentive to preserve heritage. Tadmor had that, but it was still in the hand of a very narrow cross-section of Tadmori society, and it was still very hardwired to the Syrian regime. So there was some resentment, some serious, deep-rooted resentment against the Directorate General of the Antiquities and Museums, unfortunately, in some places in the Syrian regime. During the conflict, Tadmor had become a safe haven. So Tadmor's residents had stayed there, and a large number of internally displaced persons, or IDPs, had come to Tadmor. And now they're all trapped, because the Syrian military pulled out really quickly and just left everybody. So we've got 50,000, 60,000 plus Syrians trapped out in the desert under ISIL's thumb. So to my mind, that's the main problem that we're trying to address now. The cultural heritage situation is a small but important part of that larger humanitarian mission that we have, um, to give you some idea of priorities. So the Tadmor situation in terms of the humanitarian crisis is, is, is severe, really severe. Um, so again, with, with the, the, the local heritage, we weren't surprised that they evacuated the museum. There are claims that about 99% of the antiquities were evacuated from the museum, but we know that that can't possibly be the case. And how do you count? Just the museum, we know that large amounts of sculpture are out at the site in the Hypogea, or architectural ornaments from the Bell Temple, or the, the Baal Shaman Temple, or within the Hypogea. So a large amount of antiquities fell to ISIL immediately, and we know that local Tadmores are an important part of the smuggling network that takes those antiquities to Turkey and Lebanon. They were before the conflict, they were before ISIL came to Tadmor, and they're still working now within ISIL to, to loot, traffic, and sell those antiquities because they need the money to feed their families, right? So that's what's really difficult here is that what ISIL does is when they move into these areas, they set up antiquities offices or infrastructure and they license locals, this is a license, to loot archeological sites, smuggle antiquities, and sell antiquities, and ISIL gets money at all three points in that process. But it's rather hands off for ISIL. Remember I showed you them smashing those sculptures? It was because those guys in Membage got caught without one of these pieces of paper from ISIL. And it was a way to put the message out that you don't smuggle antiquities through ISIL territory without ISIL paperwork. ISIL also loots directly uh, important sites like tombs. If they find tombs or really rich context, ISIL fighters do the looting. And it's a more direct source of income for them. But anyway, there's, there's mixed, you know, ISIL has been able to find people that are willing to help them destroy sites and to loot sites. It, it, and there's been a lot of backlash, particularly in tribal areas, where sites were protected and local farmers couldn't farm on those sites, or irrigate, or plant olive trees, or cotton on those sites, expand their fields, or build a house. There's a site everywhere in Syria, at every village, and those sites were protected. And so the locals very oftentimes feel some resentment 
And so as soon as you know, the, the, you know, these areas have gone out of regime control, we've seen rampant, you know, rampant development, agriculture, house building, road construction, and looting as a way to essentially support families. ISIL just comes in and their new management. And they tap that local resentment and desperation to fund their organization and to carry out this, this brutal cultural cleansing that we see. So it's, it's a very, again, a very dire situation. What's the reaction in the Shiite world? They're appalled. And they understand that with the, the bombings in mosques in Saudi, Yemen, in the south of Iraq, it's obvious that what's going on is that they're trying to foment uh, sectarian strife. They're trying to further southern Iraq's involvement in the crisis, Saudis, and Iran. ISIL and other Al-Qaeda Al affiliates thrive on chaos. That's where they make their money as an organization. They're really just a very large organized crime network that thrives on chaos in North Africa and the Middle East. So they want to proliferate the conflict. And they've got, you know, to them, the, their main target then, of course, is going to be the Shia and the Kurds as well. So you'll see a lot of targeting of uh, Sufi heritage and Yazidi heritage which is closely associated with the Kurdish ethnicity in the region. So I think that there is a recognition among the Shia that they're being baited. But if you go to someplace like northern Iraq, in the city of Mosul, you have a population that's under ISIL, but they don't want to be liberated by the Kurds to their east or the Shia government of Iraq to the south. And so they're feeling that they really don't have anywhere to turn except possibly the United States coming back again to Northern Iraq to run ISIL out. So again, another, it's such a complicated situation on the ground from region to theater to theater. In Syria, you know, very different conditions. So we have the Russians moving in and helping the Assad regime, which is the, uh, the last two weeks of the big game changer. Yeah, I just wondered if anybody has been able to We're, we're, we are still working back on our retro reporting for the period before our project was founded last year to take things back to 2011. And for Syria, it's well over a 1,000 sites that have been severely damaged. Um, archaeological sites, mounds, built heritage. In Iraq, it's almost exclusively been Islamic State deliberate destructions of heritage places, and it's around 250 to 300 but we're still verifying them and, and trying to document them in detail. So when I give you a number of 80 for Iraq, I'm working on an additional 120 cases. Our project has about 40, 50 people in the US, Canada, Europe, and in the conflict zone working on this and, and you know, working back to the beginning of the conflict and trying to keep up with it. And it's all we can do to try to report on all of those cases. So to give you some idea of the extent of the damage. And we will, in this next year, hopefully catch up and we'll be able to provide some kind of a percentage there as to how many sites have been destroyed. But in some areas like Mosul or Aleppo, it's, it's city blocks of UNESCO World Heritage Site in Aleppo that's been just leveled. When I look at photographs of Aleppo, where I lived and worked off and on for 20 years, I do not recognize the major landmarks in the, in the souk or around the Aleppo Citadel, where I would go shopping on a daily basis. I, I, can't, you know, I can't find any recognizable landmarks. The minarets are all gone. Tunnel bombs have left massive craters the size of a city block. It, it's unbelievable, um, the, the devastation in just that one city. What has UNESCO been doing? UNESCO um, coordination, I, I think, is the, probably the, uh, we've, uh, our project works with UNESCO. And we provide our, the ACE or CHI reporting goes to UNESCO. UNESCO has a center in Lebanon monitoring what's going on inside the conflict zone. And they're one of the very important organizations for uh, working between, let's say, the Assad regime, the opposition, and other stakeholders. As a US government-funded program, ACE or CHI cannot work directly or fund the Director General of Antiquities and Museums, the DGAM in Syria, which is a government organization. And so we work through, let's say, UNESCO to, to coordinate efforts with the DGAM. We work, with, we work directly with the Syrian opposition and other local stakeholders. So they play a very important bridging role and coordination role in, in what's happening. I feel that our project, ASOR CHI, is the, the probably the fastest out with reporting, the most detailed with reporting. Please take a look at our website. Maybe I can go to the end of the project. Um, our website, ASOR 
slash syrianheritage.org, um, where we have our weekly reports in redacted form available online, and a lot of our other special reporting. We'll be doing a whole lot more reporting and special reporting this year. We've expanded the program. We've just been renewed. So we're, we, we now have funds to uh, gather more information from in-country sources. We're putting up a website that allows people to provide anonymous tips on heritage damage from within the conflict zone. We're going to be systematically monitoring the antiquities market and hopefully providing that information publicly on the antiquities that are appearing on the market. So again, the program has unfortunately been expanded, but I feel that our program has done a great job in its first year in monitoring, assessing, analyzing the heritage damage and, and the looting as it's, it's, it's happened. Um, we have a number of partners working with us as well. Our program uh, essentially is partnered with the German, the German team at the German Archaeological Institute and a, lot, a large number of other organizations such as the Getty and the J.M. Kaplan Fund. So it's a, it really is, it's a massive international effort. And, and so most of when we talk about UNESCO or ACE or CHI, we're all working together in close coordination to meet, to meet the crisis in Iraq and Syria. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I can come back in the year with a more positive assessment of what's happening.